Hi, Steve here at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'd like to talk about foot washing. John chapter 13. The Lord has fellowshiped with some intimate friends in Bethany and then made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. After that triumphant entry, there's been much discussion, both with the members of the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the nation, and the people, the multitudes that followed. He's claimed his deity and his sovereignty. In the first 12 chapters, the Lord has, uh, with his disciples, spoken the word of God to the multitudes, to the Jews, to the lawyers, and so forth. Beginning at chapter 13, we have nothing but intimate fellowship and communion between the Lord and his disciples. Now, some have described chapters 13 through 17 as the heart of Christ, and this is his last intimate fellowship with his own. It only lasts for a few hours but it is intense in meaning. I believe without any doubt and in agreement with the other Gospels that Jesus Christ ate the Passover supper with his disciples. The feast was the next day that followed the Passover supper. But I believe that they made ready to eat the Passover and they did eat it together. Now, a verse that you're all familiar with, John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that all who believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe that with all of my heart. I do not believe, the verse says, that He individually loved everyone in the world system. If it says that, then I have a direct contradiction in verse 1 of chapter 13, that he has his own in the world that he loved. doesn't say that he loved all, but he loved all of his own, and he loved them to the ultimate end, or to the consummation. I don't think it's just when he died on the cross, but it is an eternal love, an everlasting love. We need to understand the concept of the word world. It is a, a word that speaks of some system that's designed rather than chaotic. And that's cosmos, where we get our idea of cosmetics so that a woman can get up in the morning and not look chaotic. She puts on cosmetics and she becomes organized. It is a designed system and that's what it is. Now, that means it could be used in several contexts. He's going to depart a system, and he has a system in which he has his own, and he has a system which he loved and gave his only begotten Son that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we have to look at the word world in the proper context. There are places where the word world means all of God's elect. There are places where the word world means the theological system or the religious system. There are places where the, the word world means one's environment and activity. And so we, we have to look carefully at the context. I think the system that he's leaving is Judaism. He came to a legal system, and in that legal system, he has those whom he loves. Every Israelite was not redeemed. God's people were redeemed, and a mixed multitude followed them out of the land of Egypt. They all perished in the wilderness. Well, did they all go to hell? Well, of course not. You know, many say that every Israelite went to hell. For with most of them, God was not well pleased, and they perished in the wilderness. So they went to hell. But hold your horses just a minute. 
All right, that, that only leaves Caleb and Joshua that rules out Moses. You telling me Moses went to hell? Folks, you can't do that. How can you handle God's word that way? He wasn't well pleased with them, his people. They did perish in the wilderness. They never reached the promised land. They never reached rest, peace, and joy because they didn't trust him. And folks, that's where most Christians are. They don't trust him. They don't trust him. They don't have rest. They don't have peace. They don't have joy. But to put them all in hell is saying that Moses couldn't have been on the Mount of Transfiguration. I believe it is every bit appropriate to say that with most Christians, God is not well pleased. It was a legal system. It was a system to show that man in himself could not be acceptable to God. Something had to happen. So God declares you'll give them a new heart and a new mind so that they obey Him. They have His laws written on their heart, and we, the church, we are the first fruits of that. You are not a whitewashed old man. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, given the will of God with no ability whatsoever to sin. And that is a wonderful, wonderful truth that was done because He loved you and will to the consummation. And he did that through the cross. Jesus Christ was God Almighty. Obvious truth of Philippians chapter 2. However, He emptied Himself. He did not cease to be God. He simply emptied Himself of His glory. He became flesh. He was made in the likeness of man. Our kinsman redeemer. He became a servant. And He dwelt among us. And we see both the deity as well as the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. If He's not God, He's not able to redeem us. If He's not man, He's not a kinsman, so He can't redeem us. He must be God of very God and man of very man. The God-man Jesus Christ. But He was made a servant. He took upon Him the form of a servant. We see a lot of miracles in the Gospels. All, all the miracles. This is not some foolish tradition handed down word of mouth over many years. These things actually happened. Lepers were healed. Dead were raised. Blind were, was made to see. And the disciples knew that. But did they realize, realize, did they really realize that He had become man? That He was their kinsman? That He was a servant? If you look in verse 2 of chapter 13 of John, it says, And supper being ended. What does that sound like to you? It sounds to me like supper's over. But that is not what the Greek says. During supper is what it says. During supper. It was during supper. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The word put there is, is interesting. It's, it's balo. It's, it's from which we get the word ballistic. You know, we have ballistic missiles. God threw into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And I suppose we could spend hours deciding whether Judas was the passive recipient of this or the active recipient of this. And those, of course, are areas where you need to give serious thought to what God says. In Isaiah, he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to have the Assyrian punish Israel. And what happened? Well, the Assyrian punished Israel. Well, that makes sense. If God's going to have the Assyrian punish Israel, He's probably going to punish Israel. That all makes sense, except the next verse says that God's going to judge him, judge the Assyrian. Now, if God's going to judge him for what God had him do, well, that doesn't seem to make much sense, and, and that's where people want to argue with God. But God is right. God says, I'm going to have the Assyrian punish Israel. 
and the Assyrian punished Israel. God says, I'm going to judge the Assyrian. The question is why? says Isaiah, and God comes back and says, because his heart was not with me. The Assyrian did what the Assyrian wanted to do. He enjoyed punishing Israel. The only way that he could do it is if God let him do it, but he wanted to do it. So God's going to judge him, not for punishing Israel, but for, for his heart attitude. I don't know what Judas's heart attitude was. However, I have a powerful verse of Scripture where he said early in his ministry, you did not choose me, but I chose you for myself and ordained you that you would go forth and bring forth fruit. But one of you, one of you is a devil. Now you have to take the Scriptures and study them for yourselves. I don't believe that Judas suddenly became a devil. He was never one of God's children. He was always one of Satan's children. There is tear in the field. I didn't plant it, says God. I didn't sow it. An enemy has sowed this. The disciples go into the house and, and they say, you know, hey, tell us about that parable. And, and he says, the enemy is the devil. Well, how does the... How does the devil sow seed? I don't know. I really don't know everything. I just kind of think I do. I don't know, folks, but God says I didn't do it. An enemy sowed that seed. They asked him who the enemy was. He said, he's the devil. Now in Romans 9, we looked at the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. Those are powerful verses of Scripture. I don't fully understand them, but I, I see clearly that there is a family of God and a family of Satan, and it's Jesus Christ, not me. It is Jesus Christ who said in the early stages of His earthly ministry that one of them was the devil. Now the devil is forcibly put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Christ. Why? Why? Why betray Christ? Well, you know, well, he's an awful guy, right? I mean, he heals the sick, he gives sight to the blind, he raises the dead, he heals the leper, he feeds people who don't have any food. Good guy to betray, right? And in all honesty, we can't postulate any reason for wanting to betray Christ except for money, and boy, money is a big deal in Christianity today. You know, I really do enjoy what I do. I, I teach the Word because I feel constrained to teach the Word. I, I couldn't adequately do this without y'all's support, but some days I would give an awful lot of money if I could just get out of it. But somehow a dispensation has been placed on me but the only reason that I can come up with with Judas wanting to betray Christ is money. Now, as you know, he's the one that handled the treasury. God, who was sovereign, had all things in his control. If he knew that he was a devil and he knew that he was a, a snake in the grass, why would he let him be treasurer of the group? And I find biblically that's just characteristic of my God. He's the one that handled the money. I think there's an interesting lesson here. Eschatologically or, or prophetically, I think most Christians and most of you believe that Jesus Christ is going to return. I surely do. I anticipate His return daily. Most Christians believe he's going to return, that there's going to be a period of great trouble and distress on the earth. He'll then come back victorious, and he'll establish an earthly kingdom, and he'll rule and reign in righteousness. Won't be any war. Thousands of years, no war. It's never happened in the history of mankind. A thousand years, no war. Lion lay, 
lies down with the lamb. Uh, child steps on the scorpion, isn't hurt. Uh, lion eats straw like the ox. Why would anybody rise up and try to overthrow a government like that? Man, we don't like this government. We want poverty. We want war. We want distress. We want difficulty. We want trouble at every turn. We want crime. We, Folks, that doesn't make any sense. Now, I, I mentioned money, and I've, I've tried to lead you down this canyon. I believe there is a more valid reason for betraying Christ, and that's because He's righteous. Why would literally millions of people at the end of a thousand year reign with peace and joy and rest, you know, they'll not hurt nor destroy uh, all my... My holy mountain, says the Lord. That's the kind of government we want. You're never going to get anybody to join you in an overthrow of such a government. But we hear that there is a great number that no man can number that go up against Jerusalem and against the Lord. Why? Well, I'm not so sure it's money there. I think it's righteousness. Man unredeemed man does not want righteousness he's not interested in god's justice he's interested in his own justice and i think satan and uh and you know well i think i have scriptural authority for that it, he's totally opposed to jesus christ his person his work his righteousness his holiness so maybe in my human mind, I can only come up with money as the root. But as I look at the Word of God, I believe it's the holiness and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Righteousness. It's a simple word, but one I think that annoyed Judas. And he had to face it every day. You know, for three to five years, or however long it was. So Jesus rises from supper. He lays aside His garment. He takes a towel, he girds himself, he pours water into the, uh, a basin, it's, it's articulated, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel uh, by, by which he was girded. Now, he knew three things. He knew he was going to leave the system. He knew he had those in the system that he loved. And he knew that the Father had given all things into his hand. Now, those are three interesting reasons that would lead him to wash the disciples' feet. In Philippians, we were told that he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The first thing that's mentioned is his form of a servant. And that's the first thing that we see in this intimate communication with the disciples. We see him acting as a servant. Well, that's what he is. When it says he took upon himself the form of a servant, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God or to have the form of God. He being in the form of God was made in the likeness of man took upon him the form of a, ser of a servant, same word. So as much as he was God, he's a servant. And here he displays vividly that he is a servant. His feet were anointed with oil. They, they weren't washed. These are two separate accounts. They, they didn't need to be washed. Here he is washing their feet with water, not with blood. Christianity for 2,000 plus years or whatever has perverted the truth of the Word of God in reapplying the blood. You know, are you washed in the blood? You know, you're not washed in the blood. You know, you're washed in water. He cleansed us once and for all. That's Hebrews. He made us righteous, but the cleansings with water. If, if it's blood, he has to die again, and he doesn't die again. 
and to suggest that he does, it, that's, well, simply blasphemy. It's always impressed me, any of you who've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know, you ought to read that and then say, you know, would I do that? You know, would I do that? You know, would someone say, well, I believe the bread is actually changed into the body of Christ and the wine actually into the blood of Christ. That means he, he died again. I don't believe that. I think that's blasphemy. Well, we're going to burn you at the stake if you believe that. You know, it's really not that important, right? I think that's modern Christianity. But those people died, folks. They died for their conviction on one simple biblical principle. They died for it. I don't see that conviction in modern Christianity. He's going to wash them with water. We know water represents the Word. So he poured water into the basin. He began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the, the towel uh, by which he was girded. Do I believe that happened? Absolutely. No doubt. I don't have the least doubt that happened. That, that God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, rose up during the supper time, during that time, took a basin of water and a towel and began to wash his disciples' feet. They're lying on a couch around the table. Uh, they, they don't have any shoes on, you know, because the shoes are left at the door as, as, a, as they always were at my grandma's house, which, you know, I, which I stopped going there because I had to take my shoes off. Anyway, that's, that's another story. But anyhow, they didn't have any shoes on, so he started to wash their feet and he used water in a basin. Do I believe that happened? Absolutely. Do I think they could see it? Yeah, it's hard for me to believe that John's John's laying there and, and Christ starts to wash his feet and John doesn't know that he's washing his feet. And, and, you know, and I'll bet John knew his feet were wet for a while. I think he just knew that. And now we come to Simon Peter. He said unto him, What I do now, thou knowest not. You got to be kidding. Right? Boy, it looks like water. I mean, that looks like feet. That looks like a towel. What do you mean? Peter doesn't know. If he doesn't know that Christ is there using water to wash his dirty feet and wipe them with a towel, well, he's kind of dumb, ignorant, or blind. And yet Christ says, you don't know what I'm doing. So the significance of what Christ is doing is not the physical act. Don't come here to be you get your feet washed in the creek. There ain't much water in it. No, it's not the, it's not the physical act. And yet some, and, and I love them dearly. My mother was one. She believed that's a physical act that we ought to do. You know, and I tried to say, well, you know, maybe that's that's what the Jews thought when they worshipped the brazen serpent. Boy, that was a real important thing. You know, we ought to worship that thing. And yet we're commanded to do what he's actually doing. He says, Peter doesn't know what he's physically doing. If Peter doesn't know what he's physically doing, Peter's a nut. Now, folks, you've got to agree that Peter knew what, what, what he was physically doing. Peter didn't know at that time what he was spiritually doing. We do because we know that he's cleansed us with the water of the Word. We're washed with the water of the Word. He came to Peter. It's interesting what Peter says. What I'm doing now, you don't know, but you'll know it hereafter. There's two words for know there. The first one, you know, is oida. Uh, I've talked about these in the past. The Greek word oida means perfect knowledge. The second one is gnosko, experiential knowledge. In the Greek, Peter said, thou shalt never wash my feet. The Greek says, thou shalt absolutely never wash my feet. 
for eternity. It's a strong negative. Peter really emphasized it there. You're not going to do it today. You're not going to do it for all eternity. You're never going to wash my feet. That's what Peter said. I can't imagine my Lord and Master washing my feet. Well, Jesus' answer is wonderful. If, if I wash thee not, not, if I wash thee not, oh man, how many Christians have read that? You know, if you don't wash your feet, if you don't wash your feet, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. That's a powerful, powerful verse, folks. What is what does part mean? Well, some say, well, part means you're, you're going to go to hell. I think the word part means fellowship. If I don't wash your feet, you don't have any fellowship with me. And what I want you to see is what I'm doing now. I'm actually cleansing your walk. You are not, you, Peter, are not cleansing your walk. Everybody that teaches this passage of Scripture winds up with something, you know, something you got to do. You know, you got to, you got to cleanse your walk. You got to clean up the old man. You know, you got to clean up the flesh. They're not cleansing their walk. He's doing it. If you don't understand what I'm doing now, you will know hereafter. And I read in 1 John, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, that's truth, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. If I wash thee not, thou hast no fellowship with me. Now, of course, Peter immediately comes back and wants, well, he wants all of him. He, he wants a whole complete bath. You know, He wants everything washed. From verse 4 on, there are present tenses. He rises from supper. That's a present tense. He pours water. That, that's a present tense. And, and so forth. It's something that Christ is continually doing. It is He... Christ, who's doing the washing, we don't do it, He does, and it is fabulous to realize what God has done for us. I've talked to you folks about this before. Do you realize that your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea, cast behind His back, sought for and not found? Why is it? that multitudes of churches are in the business of burdening Christians with guilt. The good news is God has nothing against you. That He has, he has perfected you forever. That He's redeemed you to Himself. That He's made you righteous. That He has forgiven all of your trespasses. All. All trespasses. You will not remember your sins in eternity. Because He won't remember them. If you were to, to somehow remember your sins in, in, in heaven, well, then God would have to remember them. And God says He's forgot them. Because God knows every thought. Moreover, I don't think God remembers our sin now. Though most Christians, that's all they seem to focus on. Imagine walking through this life focused on on that which God has clearly said that He's forgotten. Look, I love you all, I truly do. Join us on Sunday as we continue on, as we just got started in the Epistle to the Galatians. I love you all, I truly do. Until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.